In the world beyond the Soviet Union, these are years when Europe marches to the beat of Adolf Hitler's drum. Already in 1936, just three years after he comes to power, Hitler has sent his as yet unprepared army to occupy the Rhineland, demilitarized by the Versailles Treaty, which concluded the Great War. It is his first most dangerous step, a moment when, for Adolf Hitler, everything teeters on the edge. Even his position as Führer itself depends on the reaction of the Western Allies. We know now that he has ordered an immediate German retreat if French forces oppose them. He has taken a desperate risk to throw down an early challenge to Versailles at the treaty he came to power promising to break. But in this vital test of nerve, Britain and France fail to act. It is the first of many failures of Western nerve, failures bound to give the leadership of the Soviet Union serious cause to reflect. Worse is the news of a pact signed by Germany and Japan and later joined by Italy, a treaty which targets the Soviet Union. To Stalin, there could be no stronger sign of the reckless speed with which Hitler intends to move. In the Kremlin, the message is clear. The Versailles Treaty, that whole rearrangement of frontiers imposed on Europe by the victorious Western Allies, has now no more than a few years to live. There are too many disputed territories in Europe, too many claims and counterclaims. At home, Stalin's leadership is unchallengeable. He relishes the title of great leader. But the great leader is tainted with a fatal sickness. His malady is not physical. It resides in an unrivaled greed for power and festers with a paranoid distrust of every other human being. And as you know, he died alone in his own self-made prison. He lived in a corridor in which there were three doors which led to three separate apartments, each with their own bedrooms. And every morning he would telephone for breakfast, lunch or dinner, and every day they would bring him three separate breakfasts, lunches and dinners and place one by each door and then immediately leave so that no one would know from which door he would take his breakfast. And that is how he lived, hateful and hated. The deathbed warning of Lenin and Trotsky's denunciation of Stalin as the gravedigger of the revolution have been chillingly justified in these years of arrest, murder, and enslavement of the Soviet people. Stalin has one single solution for all opposition to his will, and he sees foreigners, Westerners in particular, as people with the power to infect Soviet citizens with a nameless plague. For Stalin, this is reality. A squadron of the United States Navy visits the far east Russian port of Vladivostok. Grigory Okunev was chief political officer of the Pacific Fleet. His nephew, Ilya, was a small boy at the time. My uncle's fate was tragic. I myself was an involuntary witness of that unusual event in Vladivostok. A squadron of American warships, consisting of one battle cruiser, Augusta, and four destroyers, was paying a visit of friendship. The squadron was under the command of Admiral Ernel. The visit lasted four days. American sailors roamed freely in the city, talking to the people, exchanging souvenirs, taking photographs. 
The Americans allowed the locals free access to the cruiser, showing it to anyone who wanted to see. I was there with my uncle, and Admiral Arnell met him personally. The Admiral took me around and showed me the gun turrets and plane decks. It was a mighty vessel. When it came into the bay, our ships that were anchored there were bobbing up and down like floats. This is an official visit, sanctioned by the authorities, the sort of visit paid by navies all over the world. We shall never know who brought it to Stalin's notice. When the American squadron left Vladivostok, mass arrests of personnel in our Pacific fleet began. Sailors were accused of being recruited by American intelligence and becoming American spies. Furthermore, when I managed with great difficulty to get hold of the 150-page file on Okunyev from the KGB, I saw that all the evidence was false because it had obviously been dictated to the prisoners by their interrogators. I also obtained his death certificate. It said that the cause of death was by shooting. Stalin's reckless savagery now leaves no area of Soviet life untouched. Literature and even science must conform. <laughs>